Our speaker this evening is John <coughs> Nelson Ricard, Captain, Canadian Military. This is, John has written a book when he was working on his PhD, master's and PhD, he tried to do the things that, that we have done in the past, is find things that maybe aren't as well covered. And uh, believe me, this book, Patent at Bay, is one of those. So John, thank you for coming down from Canada, and we are thrilled to have you here. Well, thanks very much. Uh, welcome uh, to the uh, topic tonight. Uh, greetings from Canada. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be in the company of uh, World War II veterans, uh, the generation that uh, Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation. My family all fought in World War II, uh, and from my perspective, Tom Brokaw was, uh, was correct. You are the greatest generation, and uh, I try to live my life every day to try to match a little bit of your intensity and your passion and your commitment that uh, is still evident in uh, everyone that I talk to, even today, uh, all the veterans that I see still have a passion for their country, whether it's in Canada, the United States, or Britain, or Australia. Uh, and I'm sure that if, if time were, were more kind to you, you'd volunteer and, and be fighting again in the front line, I have no doubt. I'd like to thank uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, sorry, Colonel Patton and the History Roundtable for inviting me here today. The title of my presentation is Operations Across Northwest Europe, but it specifically looks at Patton's Third Army in Lorraine and is based on my work, Patton at Bay, that was published back in 1999. My intention here tonight is to give you some idea of the grim three month campaign and its place in the larger strategy of the Western Front. As you all know very well, the Allies invaded Normandy on June 6, 1944, and fought a desperate series of operations to break out of the bridgehead. While Montgomery's British and Canadians engaged the bulk of German panzer forces around Caen, American soldiers slugged their way south through the hedgerow country. By 25 July, the Americans had launched Operation Cobra and broke through the German left flank. Into this breach poured Patton's Third Army. You also know the results. The Germans tried to cut off the Third Army at Mortain, but failed and suffered grievous losses, escaping the Filet's pocket. On August 19th, Eisenhower decided to push on beyond the Seine River in pursuit, weeks ahead of the Overlord timetable and the, the logistics plan. He immediately argued with Montgomery on the best way to achieve the end of the war after crossing the Seine. You have heard it described as Eisenhower's broad front strategy versus Montgomery's narrow thrust strategy. In fact, there was a difference between them on the idea of concentration of effort. In Montgomery's mind, the principle of concentration meant the concentration of force on a narrow front in depth. Here's what Montgomery uh, intended. After crossing the Seine, which is right here. He wanted to launch a, com a powerful combined thrust by 1st Canadian Army, the 2nd British Army, the 1st US Army, and this last part is key, despite the rivalry, Monty clearly wanted Patton with him to provide the breakthrough force in reserve, punching through the breachhead, in effect, replicating Normandy. Patton held reserve to exploit penetration. After that, Montgomery wanted to cross the Rhine to capture the critical Ruhr industrial region, which is right there in that circle. Eisenhower's conception is radically different. He wanted Monty to advance with 1st Canadian Army, 2nd British Army, assisted by a portion of General Omar Bradley's 12th Army Group, on the northern axis of advance, while the remainder of the army group, led by Patton's third army, advanced east towards the Tsar, Germany's second most important industrial region in the south. Eisenhower wanted an orderly advance to the west bank of the Rhine, which is right there. 
Why? Well, he wanted to stretch German forces to the extent that they could not concentrate against any one of his uh, penetrations. Eisenhower and Bradley believed in the simultaneous commitment of all available combat power. So the difference between, the, the, between Montgomery and Eisenhower about what concentration of effort meant is very dramatic. Montgomery wanted to focus on a narrow front in depth, which automatically created reserves. And Eisenhower and Bradley believed in committing all available combat power simultaneously against the enemy. Now keep in mind that the Tsar is west of the Rhine, and the Ruhr is east of the Rhine. And this puts Eisenhower in a difficult position very early on uh, from a strategic perspective. Because in order to achieve his own personal strategy of lining up uh, west of the Rhine, abreast for the final advance, he has to work with Montgomery's uh, concept, which is to jump the Rhine on a narrow front to try to end the war quickly. At the end of the day, Eisenhower has to balance the different strategies. He has to satisfy Montgomery, and he has to satisfy Bradley. Clearly, as Supreme Allied Commander Eisenhower's strategy prevails. And by the end of August, Third Army was at the Moselle River in Lorraine. And this is the campaign that's already started tonight. This box represents where Lorraine is. And here's the basic chronology for your reference. Now, although Patton was the most seasoned American commander in Europe by the time he entered Lorraine at the beginning of September 1944, keep in mind that the invasion of French North Africa, Tunisia, Sicily, and even Normandy did not prepare him for the sustained static fighting he was to encounter in Lorraine. Patton preached and practiced rapid maneuver to dislocate an enemy before attrition-type conditions were necessary. He aggressively sought to get inside an enemy's decision cycle. Whereas Montgomery preached balance and properly teeing up a battle, Patton insisted, quote, that a good plan violently executed now was better than a perfect plan executed next week, unquote. However, his established battle philosophy ran up against the hard realities of the range, and this campaign becomes his toughest test of command during the entire war. So as we go into Lorraine, there's some things I want you to keep in mind. And those are that Patton suffers from several disadvantages at the very beginning of the campaign. First, Lorraine offers challenging terrain. It was a self-contained battlefield. This is an overview of the geographical area. The top bar there represents the Ardennes Forest. The bottom bar, the black bar, represents the Borges Mountains. There are two principal cities uh, to the east of the Mosul River, Metz and Nancy. Beyond the Moselle reside several additional water obstacles. And beyond that are the fortifications of the Maginot Line. Once past the Maginot Line, any advance from the west had to contend with the Tsar River. And finally, the fortifications of the West Wall or Siegfried Line. So the entire area was a formidable uh, area to advance through. But Patton seems to have under underestimated the difficulties early on in his haste to keep moving. Secondly, in terms of number of divisions, 3rd Army uh, was at a disadvantage against uh, Patton's opponent, General of Panzer Troops Otto von Nobelsdorf's 1st Army. Hitler Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt, who was the Commander-in-Chief West, and General Oberst Johann Blaskowitz, Commander of Army Group G, and Nobelsdorf's immediate superior, considered Patton a far more dangerous opponent than Montgomery at this specific time, and considered the Lorraine approaches to the West Wall highly vulnerable. When Patton ran out of gas at the Moselle River at the end of August, there was literally nothing in front of him. 
except scratch rear guard elements. By September 5th, however, the equivalent of eight divisions had been moved into the area, making 1st Army the strongest German army in the West. This is 1st uh, Army on September 5th. That same day, Patton only had two corps with six divisions. Noblesdorf probably enjoyed a slight superiority in infantry on 5 September, but Patton possessed a sizable number of tanks, tank destroyers, and artillery that Noblesdorf simply could not match. Throughout August, Patton had also enjoyed the air support of Brigadier General O.P. Whalen's 19th Tactical Air Command. But during the early days of the campaign, many of Wayland's 550 aircraft would be diverted elsewhere, many of them actually going back to Brest, way behind the front. The third limitation under which Patton labored was a general shortage of supplies. Eisenhower repeatedly found himself caught between the demands of Montgomery and Patton. Moreover, one has to remember that Third Army was not the main effort at this time. Montgomery's 21st Army Group is the main effort. Bradley's 12th Army Group is the secondary effort. And inside 12th Army Group, Patton is, the, is not the main effort with inside the Army Group. Courtney Hodge's 1st Army is the main effort around Aachen. Patton is the secondary effort with inside a secondary effort <laughs> down in Lorraine. The result in this instance was that Patton entered Lorraine with significant shortages in fuel, ammunition, and material. Although Patton had little control over the terrain, the size of his army, or scale of supply he received, he could control how he managed the resources he did have. He did not initially employ his army in an optimal fashion because he fundamentally believed that the Germans had no power to resist and that the war was very close to being over. And it's not just him that's thinking this. This is a, uh, an illness, if you will, that, that infects all the Allied commanders. The war will be over by Christmas. The boys will be home by Christmas. Patton, like many others, suffer, suffered under the delusion that Normandy had crippled the German army in the West. His eyes were squarely set on the Rhine, and he sincerely believed that the Germans would only delay at the Mosul before retiring on the West Wall fortifications. Thus, on September 5th, Patton thought, planned, and acted under the assumption that a pursuit was not simply possible, but was actually continuing, though momentarily interrupted by logistical shortfalls. Nothing proves this more than his brief two-page operational directive to his corps commanders, Major General Walton H. Walker of 20 Corps, and Major General Manton S. Eddy of 12 Corps. Without identifying the numerous obvious hazards, Patton directed them to seize bridgeheads over the Moselle and move to secure bridgeheads over the Rhine. No serious consideration was given to the difficulty of taking Metz, the most heavily fortified city in Europe, the subsequent water obstacles, or to the substantial fortifications of the West Wall. In effect, Patton was improvising because he thought he could because he thought there was nothing in front of him, and he was desperate to keep moving and move quickly. So the litmus test of his generalship in September rests on how quickly he recognized the shift from mobile to static warfare, and then how he responded to the altered conditions. Patton's intentions to bounce the Moselle disintegrated very rapidly on 5 and 6 September. On the 5th, 12 Corps advanced to gain bridgeheads but the 80th Infantry Division was repulsed by elements of the 3rd Panzer Grenadier Division. 20 Corps advance in the north the next day fared little better when both the 7th Armored and 5th Infantry Divisions bumped into stiff resistance west of Metz. Walker had only the vaguest idea of the extent of the Metz fortifications. And during the first two days of action, 20 Corps could not even attempt a crossing. 
Walker's divisions fought simply to hold their positions on the West Bank. Patton's opening failure to rush the Mosul was the result of the dispersal of limited combat power in an effort to achieve multiple crossings for each corps. Now that's doctrinal. A, a, a corps doesn't cross a river on one crossing. You need multiple crossings to support. So that made good sense. The problem is, is that the two divisions on the flanks of Third Army, the 90th Infantry Division in the north and the 35th in the, in the uh, south, can't take part uh, in full-scale crossing efforts because they have to guard the flanks of the army. Because Patton's ahead of 1st Army in the north, and he's ahead. Uh, U.S. 7th Army hasn't come up fully abreast of 3rd Army by this time. So a lot of the combat power of the army has to be echeloned on the flanks for protection. 3rd Army could have been reinforced for the initial advance had Bradley seen fit to release the 83rd and 6th Armored Divisions, which were still abreast in the Brittany Peninsula. But he refused, telling Patton that they were needed elsewhere. By September 12th, only a week into the campaign, Walker's 12, uh, 20 Corps had managed a small bridgehead south of Metz. <coughs> at Arneville. But experienced great difficulty in trying to expand the bridgehead. Patton ranted in his diary, quote, I am doing my damnedest to get going again, but it is hard, unquote. He was straining to do some broken field running, especially after Bradley keep this in mind, summarily informs him that if he could not get across the Moselle in strength by the 14th of September, he would have to assume the defensive while all his supplies went north to Courtney Hodges' first army. Walker was pinned down at Metz, and Patton's hopes quickly fell on Manton 80's 12 Corps. Manton 80 intended to push the entire 4th Armored Division south of Metz in an effort to get going. But its commander, Major General John Shirley Wood, was appalled at the prospect of negotiating those several consecutive water obstacles, which flowed southeast away from Nancy and were directly in the path of any Fourth Armored advance, south, uh, uh, heading northwest from uh, Nancy. As a tanker myself, I agree with him. The last thing I want to see as a tanker is a water obstacle. And, this, and the next worst thing is a, another water obstacle behind that. <laughs> Wood argued for a divisional advance, for a full divisional advance north of Nancy, in a compromise, which happens a lot in the military, that frustrated Wood, Eddie split the division. The result was that Combat Command B on the southern axis got hung up on those consecutive water obstacles, while Colonel Bruce C. Clark's Combat Command A exploited a bridgehead finally won by the 80th Infantry Division north of Nancy on 12 September and poured through the gap. The picture there is uh, Colonel Clark. I couldn't find a picture of Colonel Clark as Colonel Clark, so that's Colonel General Clark. <laughs> Please uh, forgive me. Combat Command A covered the 20 miles to Chateau Salines rapidly and successfully raided the German rear areas, taking hundreds of prisoners and destroying hundreds of armored vehicles and guns. Now Patton seizes on this immediately. Clark's success really sparks Patton in this instance. It's only a, a small penetration, but Patton seizes it. And he quickly receives permission from Bradley to narrow Third Army's front to achieve a greater degree of concentration. Major General Wade Haslip's 15th Corps had just been reassigned to Third Army on the right flank or the south, and Patton intended to advance all three of his corps now northeast in column of divisions. So as you can see here, 12th Corps was to move first with 4th Armored in the vanguard, aiming to strike the west wall on a frontage approximately nine miles wide, which isn't too bad for a divisional frontage. Following hard on Wood's heels would be the 35th Infantry Division to hold the shoulders of the breach in the west wall open. 
8th Infantry Division would follow behind as soon as it had secured the bridgehead north of Nancy, which CCA had poured through in the first place. Combat Command B from Major General Robert Groves, 6th Armored Division, en route to 3rd Army, would also join the drive, as well as the 7th Armored Division, which is just south of Metz, trying to exploit their crossing, their, their small bridgehead. Of September 16th, Patton stated, quote, I was certainly very full of hopes that day and saw myself crossing the Rhine, unquote. Now keep in mind, Patton never gave his subordinates short uh, tactical objectives. Patton thought very deep. He's a, a deep thinker when it comes to objectives. So it's always the Rhine. It's not, he's not focused on the Moselle, he's not focused on hopping the Maginot Line fortifications. He's not focused on the Tsar or the West Wall. It's the Rhine. It's the Rhine. He never wants his, uh, his commanders to get alligator arms. He never wants them to think short. It's always deep. And I, I can't blame him for that in, a, in an operational sense, but it does have impacts at the planning level for his subordinate commanders. It was at this juncture that Patton's aggressive plan fell apart. He told Eddie to advance rapidly northeast on the 17th of September. But Eddie tells Patton that it, it is impossible before the 19th, declaring that, quote, all my units were in contact with the enemy, and I didn't think that by tomorrow we could either annihilate the enemy or disengage from him, unquote. Now, Eddie was an infantier, and he was concerned about pockets of resistance, while Patton, the cavalryman, had little time for isolated mopping up actions. He could have ordered Eddie to do, uh, to execute his orders, but declined. And this seems out of character for Patton at this time. In Tunisia, Patton had actually tongue lashed Eddie for not being forward with his troops. Eddie feared that, quote, I may be relieved of command, unquote. Yet Patton was not known for headhunting, despite the general perception. He only relieved two senior officers while in command. A far cry from Courtney Hodges, commander of 1st Army, who relieved no less than 11. So I'll leave it to you to determine what that really means. If a commander is relieving a lot of his subordinates, what does that mean? If he's not relieving a lot, what does that mean? I'm not going to tell you how to think, but Patton always believed that if someone was a problem, it was his problem to deal with. And he didn't like to fire someone or have someone transfer. They were one of, one of Patton's boys and he would look after. So in only two cases does he actually relieve a senior commander, a division commander, or a, a, a higher up. Only two. Courtney Hodges relieves a lot. So it's a, at the end of the day, there's a fundamental difference in command philosophy about how to handle people that aren't uh, meeting your expectations. Wood was prepared, was prepared to lead the advance, but Eddie called him back to help consolidate the bridgehead north of Nancy. This was unnecessary, for the pressure against the 80th Infantry Division was not unbearable, but Eddie's hesitation stalled the momentum. The failure of 3rd Army to exploit Wood's success in mid-September represented the greatest missed opportunity of the campaign. Eddie does bear responsibility, but Patton, did not exhibit his ruthless driving power at this critical moment. The fleeting opportunity presented by 4th Armoury in their penetration would not be duplicated during the, the rest of the entire campaign. But Wood's penetration did scare the German high command. As such, Patton was subjected to the largest counterattack mounted by the Germans since Normandy. Hitler had grandiose plans for this counterattack, hoping to crush Patton's bridgeheads on the Moselle with the aid of the 5th Panzer Army, commanded by General Panzer Troops Hassel Eckhard von Manteuffel, who himself was a first-rate armored commander from the Russian front. Most of Manteuffel's units were mere shells, but he did have some new Panzer Brigades and achieved an element of surprise against 4th Armored Division on 18 September. The initial attacks against 4th Armored at Lunaville were seen by Patton as local counterattacks. But the largest tank battle since Normandy quickly erupted at Ericourt 
And in the middle of the melee, Patton noted that the Germans were, quote, really putting on a show, unquote. Despite the counterattacks, Patton still envisioned a drive on the West Wall because, quote, the Germans fighting us now are all the Germans there are, and they have no depth, unquote. There's a lot to be said, and Patton, he, he gets it right on that. Wood clearly defeated Manteuffel's counterattack, but Eisenhower told Patton that Third Army would have to go over to the defensive on 25 September. So here is yet another missed opportunity in the campaign. One by a subordinate, now one by a superior. So Patton is, the level of frustration for him is growing because he can't get his subordinate to do what he wants him to do, and now his superior is interfering when he has a chance after he's destroyed the bulk of all the new German tanks sent to the West in the fall of 1944. He's right, there's nothing behind him. It's a straight run to the West Wall, and Eisenhower shuts him down again. This is uh, Third Army's front on 25 September. You can see Metz there and Nancy. The uh, quickly orient you, just to give you an indication. Can everyone see the laser pointer? The, the Moselle is right there. Goes like this. Third Army had started back here. Okay, so they're kind of caught up here at Metz, but the southern part of the army, 12 Corps, has pushed past Nancy and has made some good gains. 15 Corps has come up, 79th Infantry Division, and the 2nd French Armored Division down here. So he has made progress, but not as much as he wanted. So by the 25th, 3rd Army was consolidating its hard-won gains. Patton's frustration was evident, for not only had he made a significant penetration, but he had attracted and defeated a large percentage of those new tanks sent to the West. Indeed, there is considerable justification in arguing that Patton was on the verge of a major breakthrough had he just received the authority and a few more supplies, a few more gallons of miserable gasoline. So Eisenhower shuts him down on 25 September, and Patton folds his arms behind his, behind his back and discusses the situation with Willie, and there's not a whole lot they can do. <laughs> because he can't move again until Eisenhower gets some authority. The shift to a defensive posture on that date, the 25th of September, leaves Patton's line resembling a door swinging on a hinge. The center and right wing of the Army, 12 and 15 Corps, had achieved a relatively high degree of success. They had advanced 15 to 20 miles beyond the Moselle. On the left, however, Walker's 20 Corps is impaled on the sturdy Metz fortifications. Elements of 5th Infantry, and 7th Armored were across, but were contained in small bridgeheads. Thus, Metz acted precisely as the Germans had intended, as an anchor position. As long as Metz held out, men and material could be diverted to counter Patton's progress to the south. Conversely, the 3rd Army assets that were drawn into Metz were not available to exploit success <laughs> elsewhere. Now, <clears throat> That's a rough schematic of the Metz defensive system, which was based on 43 different types of forts, divided into an inner and an outer belt. The outer belt formed a salient approximately six miles west and three to four miles east of the city. Patton had little respect for fixed fortifications, but should have learned the obvious lesson that direct operations against Metz would be slow, tedious, and deadly. Fifth Infantry Division had already sustained 380 killed 2,097 wounded, and 569 missing since 5 September, simply trying to penetrate the southern perimeter. Most critically, at this time, Patton also displayed a negative attitude towards his infantry, and it's not the first time he's done this. On 18 September, he declared that, quote, it is no use making poor infantry worse by batting their heads against forts they won't take, unquote. The pattern fluctuates between condemnation and outright adoration of American infantry. He's got a lot of concerns about the training uh, and their ability to uh, 
win in difficult situations without massive artillery support. But at the end of the day, he gives them credit for the for winning the attrition type battles, the grinding, grueling attrition type battles. So when you see comments and quotes like this from Patton, you have to put it in context of his frustration level on any given day. Because we all say things we don't fully mean uh, in different circumstances. And this applies to commanders as well. So that's why there's a little bit of truth in this. But at the end of the day, he knows that the infantry is the bedrock of Third Army. And they don't go anywhere without infantry. It's great for the tanks, but you need, you need infantry. And he knows that. So this picture here is the Cam Robert line, which, which is one of the lines on the west of Metz on the outer belt. Keep in mind that many military historians claim that Metz had to be taken before any attack against the west wall could be mounted. However, General of Infantry Kurt von Tippelskirch, that's him down there in the uh, bottom right corner, he's the commander of the Metz garrison, uh, he believed it was quite sufficient to simply observe the Metz forts or encircle them with small forces. Why? Because Metz did not dispose of a main reserve in the classical sense with which they could have operated outside the fortress area or specifically interdicted Third Army's lines of communication. Venturing beyond the forts played directly into Patton's hands. Masking Metz would have given Patton the opportunity to achieve real economy of force. At one time, he had taken careful note in his annotations in his private military books of Sun Tzu's warning not to besiege towns or walled cities. But despite the clear evidence that Metz was the strongest point in Noblesdorf's line, Patton prepared a major, major assault on it and focused on a key position known as Fort Durant. There was little doubt in my mind that Patton was drawn to the challenge of Metz for historical reasons. It hadn't been taken since Attila the Hun. <laughs> Patton wanted the crack at us. <laughs> Fort Driant was five miles south of Metz on the west side of the Moselle River, located atop a 360-meter hill. Now here's a Google Earth overview that was just taken a few days ago. That is the rough outline of the main uh, bunker with the trenches. That is that same picture blown up. As you can see, you can see individual trees and the uh, trench system. This is facing uh, southwest. This had a footprint of 1,000 yards. The, the whole Durant fortification, which I'm going to show you, had a footprint of 1,000 yards by 700 yards. Now here's a schematic. In that Google Earth picture, is represented by this area right here. So in scale, you can see how much more there is to it. Finally, here's a picture uh, giving a good indication of the schematic over top of the Google Earth picture. So you can see how elaborate it is. And finally, That's a picture showing you, in dramatic terms, the elevation, how high it is. And the precipitous uh, sides, that's actually the, uh, the, the trench line. That's the actual main <coughs> bunker. So it's spread out over all this hill. The Metz is up here to the north, and the Mosul is down here. Uh, the position, Fort Durant, is a maze of tunnels. But most critically, Durant was covered by numerous other forts inside within the Metz defensive system that could rake the surface of Durant with artillery fire. So even if you manage to get through the outpost lines, the barbed wire, and actually get onto the top of the fort, German artillery from other forts could rake the top. They're all zeroed in, pre-registered. So it's a very challenging uh, fort to take. 
Major General um, Leroy Irwin's 5th Infantry Division began probing assaults on 27 September, supported by aerial bombardment by Wayland's fighter bombers, <clears throat> but quickly became convinced that attacking Fort Durant directly was a bad idea. Patton partially recognizes the difficulties, but Walker remembered him saying at the time, quote, we have put our hands to the plow, we must finish the job, unquote. Two days later, Patton <coughs> implied that he intended to encircle Metz rather than assault it directly, but he allows the Adrian operation to go forward anyway. Irwin renews his attack on 3 October. The next day, Patton ordered Walker to take Durant, quote, even if it took every man in the Corps, unquote. Again, this is pure frustration on Patton's part. The pressure mounts with the, with the arrival of the Army Chief of Staff, George Marshall, on 8 October. Here's a picture of Irwin briefing Marshall on the plan to assault Ports Somi and Blaze directly across um, Moselle from Durant, even while they're in the, in the midst of, of battling to take Durant itself. So you can see the little terrain model here that all good staff officers make for their commanders. and say, you can't go this way, perhaps you should go this way, and this way is out, and then the commander makes a decision. Staff officers plan, commanders decide. <laughs> Marshall's presence, in my opinion, didn't, didn't help things because when the press is around or superiors are around, Patton stands a little straighter and his chest sticks out a bit further and he's a, bit, he's a little bit more prone to make some bombastic statements about what he can do. Um, so I'm not sure if these visits actually help him or, or hurt him in the long run. The next day, after Marshall leaves, Patton admits in his... Uh, diary that the show is going sour. We will have to pull out at Durant. By the 13th, Irwin had, had uh, withdrawn all his men out of the fort at the cost of 64 dead, 554 wounded, and 187 missing. As bad as it was at Durant, Patton had at least admitted he was wrong. Despite the old blood and guts label, he was not prepared to sacrifice men to his own hubris when the possibility of success had disappeared entirely, and he listened to his division commander. He listened to Irwin. When Irwin said, we can't keep this up, Patton listens to sound reason and stops, calls off the operation. So, a reasonable effort had been, take, had been made to take the fort, and a rational analysis had been conducted by Patton at the end of the day saying, okay, We've got to do this a different way. Now keep in mind that this operation, two weeks, two weeks and a few days, the patent allows Durant to go on. In my mind, his, his willingness to pursue a bad position was much more favorable than Courtney Hodges in the Hurtman Forest. If you study the Hurtman Forest campaign, you'll quickly realize that Hodges sent one good U.S. division into that forest after another over the course of three or four months to get chewed up. Basically ruins four or five American infantry divisions at a time when there are only 90 U.S. Uh, divisions available for the whole war and only 88 sea combat and there's only so many infantry divisions in Europe. So as far as managing his resources, you have to give Patton higher marks than his uh, brother army commander to the north. While Durant had been a failure, Major General James A. Van Fleet, commander of the 90th Infantry Division, succeeded in capturing the industrial town of Maziers le Metz, which is five miles due north of Metz, <clears throat> in brutal urban combat by the end of October. This was an important victory, for it unlocked one of the important Metz peripheral angers. At the same time, Eddie gains bridgeheads across the Sel River. Now the Sel flows southeast from Metz, right down through 12th uh, Corps zone. And Eddie manages to get across there in limited operations and gets a good bridgehead. That's the Sel, and that's what they had to do to get across the Sel River. The weather is getting worse by the day, rain is increasing, temperatures are dropping, and mud is becoming uh, pervasive. 
So in this downtime between September 25th and November 8th, when Patton kicks off his offensive again, Third Army sustains 9,000 casualties, while technically on the defensive. But Patton's refusal to surrender the initiative put him ultimately in a better position to commence his new offensive in early November. And overall, I give him a great deal of credit for having the character to maintain his aggressiveness uh, for many reasons. For keeping his troops sharp so they didn't lose that edge when November 8th came around, and for the operational advantage these limited operations gave him. He knows it's going to be a hard slog on November 8th, and he's trying to find the best positions to gain positional advantage against his opponent when he kicks off the game, or whenever Eisenhower lets him go. And he, he doesn't know. He doesn't know when. So, we move on to the November offensive, November 8th. Patton and his staff completed two basic plans during the defensive stage of the campaign, predicated upon the assumption that Third Army would be heavily reinforced to six infantry divisions and three armored divisions. So that's what the lineup looked like for November 8th. Tenth Armored is now in, 26th Infantry Division is now in, 4th and 6th Armored are still there, 35th Infantry is still there, 80th is still there, 5th and 90th, and the 95th is on its way. At the same time, Noblesdorf, the commander of German 1st Army, loses some of his best divisions and corps staff to the preparations for the Ardennes counteroffensive. So as Patton's getting stronger in uh, early November, the first army is getting weaker. Patton's plan A envisioned one armored division north of Metz and two south with the intention of circling Metz. Plan B envisioned all three armored divisions all three armored divisions advancing south of Metz. As the plans develop and the staff officers had their go at it, Patton chooses Plan A. He had become convinced that the 3rd Army required additional training in fortress warfare and decided to isolate the Metz fortifications rather than assault them directly. He hoped that once the German forces had been drawn in to defend Metz, opportunities would present themselves for exploitation elsewhere along the front. Ironically, he thought such opportunities would manifest themselves north of Metz not in 12th Corps sector. So, 3rd Army commences the final stage of the campaign on 8 November, with most of its critical logistical shortfalls corrected. Patton has received substantial uh, infantry replacements and had thousands of tons of engineer supplies stockpiled. He does achieve complete surprise on November 8, despite terrible flooded conditions on the Moselle and all the other rivers. Walker made good initial progress <coughs> first. In the north, Van Fleet's 90th Infantry Division succeeded in crossing the flooded Moselle River, but the construction of a bridge capable of bearing the 10th Armored Division was impossible. Now remember, 90th was to cross and, and form a bridge, uh, build a bridge with 10th Armored exploiting through uh, 90th to be the northern pincer uh, coming behind Metz. That doesn't happen for a week because they can't get the bridge up because the rivers have swollen to three or four times their width. So the 10th Armored cannot cross until November 14th and thus sits out of the battle for almost an entire week. South of Metz, Irwin was relying on Operation Madison, a massive aerial bombardment designed by Whalen to get him past the Metz forts. Almost 700 heavy bombers struck the forts, the southern forts, on November 9th, but appear to have caused little structural damage. What they did do was cripple German communications and stun the defenders for days and allowed Irwin to establish a bridgehead across the Sell River, which flowed southeast from Metz. By November 19th, 11 days after the new offensive uh, starts, Van Fleet and Irwin link up east of Metz completing the planned development. 
down in 12 core sector, 80 had inflicted appalling damage on the Germans in his path, firing, 20, firing 23,000 rounds of artillery in the first 24 hours. So he has a massive set-piece fire plan in place, and it destroys, basically cripples the German division in front. Patton was impressed with the initial gains and told Eddie to push hard. But circumstances quickly begin to weigh against Patton's operational design yet again. The most important factor was the horrendous weather conditions, which quickly ruins plans based on rapid, rapid exploitation. Even back as early as 21 October, Patton observed that, quote, the country is as about, is as, about as muddy as I have ever seen it, unquote. Patton also had to deal with the fact that Bradley withdrew the 83rd Infantry Division from 3rd Army with exasperating abruptness at this time, specifically when the division was to have played a key role in clearing the Tsar Moselle Triangle. Patton had intended to clear the triangle in an attempt to outflank the strongest positions in the West Wall to the north. So this is the Tsar Moselle Triangle. This is the West Wall that comes down. 20 cores down here. Metz is down here. 12 cores to the south. As you go along the West Wall, it gets very thick, and you quickly run into a double belt. So West Wall uh, built uh, into the cities, into the industrial cities, followed by a, a, a secondary belt in behind, in depth. So Patton's trying to avoid that uh, heavy defensive area and outflank it by pushing north and taking this triangle and then coming around. But Bradley takes away the 83rd Infantry Division, which was supposed to uh, launch a concentric attack with 90th, 10th Armored to take this. 83rd Infantry Division is gone and out of the order of battle for 3rd Army. <coughs> So, Patton's furious at Bradley, again, <laughs> and notes in his diary, quote, I hope history rec records his moral cowardice, unquote. <laughs> Patton could get a little abrupt with his, uh, his diary at times, particularly with, with Ike and Brad and uh, a whole bunch of other people, so. <laughs> Tank and infantry elements from the 10th Armored and the 90th Infantry Division simply could not penetrate the Orschel's switch line, which ran across the base of the triangle. So this is the base of the triangle. Now just imagine an extension of the west wall fortifications coming across laterally like this. Dragon's teeth, anti-tank ditches, barbed wire, the works that ran laterally across this, specifically to protect any advance north into the triangle. They can't get through. <coughs> By 27 November, Patton gave up trying to go into the Tsar Moselle Triangle. And the result was that 12, uh, 20 Corps is funneled directly into the strongest portion of the West Wall. So what became an outflanking operation now becomes a canalizing operation. And that's, that's one of the fundamental elements of defense. As a defender, I'm going to channel you where I want you, where I want you to go. I want you to come into my kill zone. And this is the way this works. He can't outflank, he can't get into the triangle, so he has no choice but to direct 20 corps straight into the teeth of the, the West Wall defenses. Patton had no control over the weather or Bradley, but he continued to advance on a broad front. As a result, Third Army's operations lose a measure of synchronization after Metz. I think in part because the triangle messes up at, at the operational level, and he's a little uncertain about how he wants to approach this now because he knows how tough that west wall fortification line is in front of him. Moreover, despite the sea of mud and the fact that the additional German divisions, that additional German divisions had arrived because Third Army had attacked ahead of the armies to its north and south, Patton continued to give Eddie and Walker unrealistic objectives. On 23 November, Patton once again, once again gave Walker and Eddie the ultimate task of securing bridgeheads over the Rhine and his operational directives to them. 
They haven't even gotten to the west wall yet. Patton's still the Rhine, the Rhine. By November 30th, Eddie's renewed offensive had stalled five miles from Sarguminis on a 25-mile front. The fierceness of the opposition uh, opposite Eddie, as well as his long regrouping periods, is indicative in the fact that by mid-December, 12 Corps just managed to close on the German border, and in only one sector did he manage to penetrate the frontier. Walker could do no better, and there was no sprint to the Tsar River. It was a slow, methodical, and casually intense advance. By 2 December, 3rd Army's combat power was beginning to wane once again. Patton was now 10,000 men short of establishment and was forced to draft thousands of men out of 3rd Army's rear areas to retrain as infantry back in Metz. He admitted on 5 December that although the enemy had, quote, nearly reached his breaking point, we are stretched pretty thin ourselves, unquote. Patton also concluded that he had to relieve his longtime friend, John Wood, who apparently was displaying some signs of fatigue and who simply did not get along well with Eddie. Wood's replacement was Patton's chief of staff, uh, Major General Hugh J. Gaffin. Now, from all indications, Wood was beloved by Fourth Armor. He was he is synonymous with Fourth Armor as their fighting commander. There's there's an excellent article on the relief of General Wood in the Journal of Military History. If anyone's interested in it, uh, A. Harding Gantz wrote an excellent article which talks about the personalities involved and the decision Patton had to make about whether to leave Wood in command. It, it appears that Wood was becoming very sensitive about the casualties 4th Armour was taking because of the type of fighting 4th Armour was doing. Wood, like Patton, wanted 4th Armour to break clean and do some open field running, and Wood is forced to actually slug it out. And Patton is forced to slug it out. It's getting to Patton, and I think it probably gets to Wood a little bit as well. And at some point, he probably becomes sensitive about casualties to the point that he's on the verge of being insubordinate to A. So take that for what it's worth. You can make your own judgment after you have a look at that article. But I strongly, if you, especially if you're, if you're a fan of General Wood, have a look at that article. It's very revealing. So this is one of the only commanders Patton ever relieves, and it's his, one of his best friends. Conditions deteriorate further once 3rd Army closed to the Tsar and started to force crossings. Patton chose to attack straight into the heavily fortified cities such, such as Villigan. And Villigan's there. You just can't see it <laughs> because of the conditions. But to get to these cities across in the West Wall fortifications, 3rd Army had to get across the Tsar, which is flooded. And they take a lot of casualties just trying to get across the river. Because the current's fast, and the Germans are there. They're in strength, in the bunkers. And the bunkers are right down at the water line, right down at the, at the river's edge. That's Dilligan. This is Sarlotum, which is right here. Crown Lothran is over here. Railway yards are here. Patton strikes straight into Sarlatan and tries to gain bridgeheads across the Moselle River. As you can see by the flow of the river uh, and the bends, it poses a real tactical challenge to get across the river. What point, at what point do you cross where you're not inflated by enemy fire on all sides? Difficult, difficult uh, task. The decision to once again make a large city a principal axis of attack was highly questionable. Indeed, when one looks at the maps displaying Patton's battle line at points in time during the campaign, a pattern is quickly apparent. In effect, the Germans were able to dictate his rate of advance because of three principal anchor positions. Metz, the Orschel's switch line, which is in the Zero Moselle Triangle, and the section of the West Wall from Sarlatern, that picture there, 
uh, north to Merzig, which is on the uh, east side of the Tsar Moselle Triangle. Metz allowed German forces to pivot and slow Eddie's rate of advance in 12 Corps, maintaining the integrity of the Orscholz line, funneled Walker straight into the Sarlatern Merzig area. This strong fixed position of Sardin, where Eisenhower gave him command of American forces preparing to attack in the bulge. The Rhine, Patton's ultimate objective in every operational order he issued during the Lorraine campaign, was still 70 miles away. <coughs> so in conclusion, the three-month-long campaign tested Patton's generalship like no previous or subsequent campaign. He ends up fighting the strongest concentration of German forces in the West, including elements of three different armies, 1st, 19th, and 5th Panzer, comprising 18 different divisions. The campaign was grim, and the casualty, casualty list bears this out. 3rd Army sustained 50,000 casualties, or approximately one-third of its entire war total in Lorraine. But Patton had inflicted far greater damage on the Germans. By continuing to relentlessly advance, he drew in valuable reserves of men and equipment intended for the Ardennes counteroffensive, and Patton's material losses were replaceable. German material losses, however, were not replaceable at this stage of the war. There were many things that Patton could not control in Lorraine, and the fact that he had no prior experience in this type of fighting must be admitted up front. However, he continually ex exhibited certain tendencies. He consistently underrates the effects of weather in German resistance, inclined somewhat towards dispersal rather than concentration at times, exhibited an odd inability to oppose his will on subordinates, exhibited a tendency to undervalue synchronization, or maybe was, in a, was unable to achieve it the way he envisioned it, and displays a consistent willingness to at attack strength rather than weakness. All this being said, the campaign was still a success. It's no blitzkrieg like Normandy, but he deserves a considerable amount of credit for a fairly steep learning curve when it came to dealing with Metz. Had he bypassed it in September and moved off smartly east, this is a key point for me, had he taken it, uh, bypassed it in September the way he does in November, there's simply no telling how much support he might have received from Bradley and Eisenhower if he was able to conclusively demonstrate that he really was the lead horse and, sh and was the best prospect for making a deep penetration into Germany, there's no telling what Bradley and Eisenhower would have given him. Because after September 17th, for example, after Market Garden fails, uh, Eisenhower does lose a tremendous amount of confidence in Montgomery. Because they're not across the Rhine. And the war is still producing tanks and, and uh, artillery and, and uh, everything else that the Germans need to fight. Lorraine was not Patton's finest hour. But the key point is, is that this general had enough substance to him, was skilled enough at his craft that we, we, we don't have to uh, simply say he was infallible or simply say he was terrible because he generates emotions. People either love him or hate him. In my opinion, there's an incredible amount of substance there. He is a true professional. He is a skilled uh, uh, tradesman in his craft, which is waging war. He demonstrates what good commanders are supposed to do, which is learn. And he does learn, in my opinion, at a very fast rate. For a general to pull back from an operation like Durant after two weeks, and then radically redesign his whole operational approach to a large city like that, to me is impressive. And I don't see that in a lot of other American commanders at his level, army commanders. So with that, I thank you very much. I particularly thank you for coming here tonight to listen to me when you could have been home listening to Obama and McCain. <laughs> Our first speaker 
is Don Cruz. Uh, Don's brother was unable to be here tonight, but he's got an unbelievable story. Uh, he was a member of the 42nd Cav Recon Squadron, and I, I think there is too little notice of these units that are going out there, driving down the roads, never knowing when you're going to uh, run into a German patrol or a German stronghold. Uh, Don is speaking on his brother's behalf, Vernon. Uh, I, I do want to mention, Vern has been written up in two books. One is in Al Zidane's book, War Stories, done by the American Legion. And why don't you hold up? Uh, he, uh, no, yeah, there you go. And here's the War Stories book that uh, was done, and the most recent book of Tom Sailors. He's also written up uh, because he did run into a town and got captured by the Germans. Our uh, second speaker is uh, a guy that I've gotten to know very well and have enjoyed knowing. Merle Bergstaller was in the 6th Armored Division. You remember seeing that on the screen. And we had the great pleasure of uh, being he, he and two of his sons were on our trip to the Battle of the Bulge, and we walked in some of the grounds that he did and saw some of the palaces that he slept in. <laughs> and uh, Earl Hall, who has uh, not spoken on some of his combat experience, uh, Earl was part of capturing, if you remember our program several years ago, capturing some of the Nazi technology as they went across. And Earl, would you hold up your book there? Earl and Joe Fitzharris wrote a book called Patents Fighting Bridge Builders. And we, again, we have that in the lobby. We have the longest march in the lobby. And we also have another book that uh, I, I think is important and maybe we can talk about a little bit later. Uh, the uh, gasoline the patent by a gentleman of the name of Al Erzig. Uh, Al Erzig, I, I was in hopes of getting him here. He was actually a battalion commander in the 4th Armored Division in World War II. Still in great health and very lucid and actually just published a book on his uh, uh, time in uh, Vietnam. Uh, I, I want to recognize, before we go on with the three veterans that are going to be speak, uh, Milt Koschel, would you stand up? Milt was in the 4th Armored Division and was on the uh, infamous Hamelberg Raid. And uh, we're glad you're here this evening, Milt. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, let's start uh, with the, the, the veterans, and, and I'm going to come back, so if any of you in Third Army, uh, you're not out of the woods yet. Don, uh, how did your brother Vern, how did he get enter the military? He was drafted, like most people, in 1943. And came in through Fort Snelling? Correct. Uh, the president loved all those guys. Uh, he, uh, where did he uh, do his training? Uh, after uh, we went to Fort Snow, of course, and from there, uh, they sent him to Fort Knox for armor training. How did he uh, end up? Uh, I think he was actually in a, a combo section with the uh, CAV. Actually, uh, went through standard armor corps uh, basic training and after basic training. He went to uh, uh, school for uh, radio repair, MOS 648, and then a uh, follow-up school for radio operation. Uh, Merrill, how did you uh, get in the military? You got that infamous letter, uh, Uncle Sam wants you? Got a letter without a stamp. <laughs> Postage too? <laughs> that followed. 
Can you talk a little bit about your uh, entry, where you went in, and, and the first uh, little bit of your entry into the service? I was graduated at 17, uh, was in training for machine shop and tool grinding and tool making when Pearl Harbor happened. I went into a defense plant for a year and then was drafted by Hennepin County Board 19, came into Fort Snelling for a week on KP, and then sent to Fort Sheridan, Illinois for anti-aircraft artillery training. Okay, thanks, Pearl. Uh, Earl, Earl, uh, pass the mic down. Earl, uh, uh, everyone will know the joke on this, I think. Earl went to the greatest university in the world. At that time, it was a college. Uh, can you tell us about that, Earl? Well, speak, speak into the mic, Earl. In 1939, I finished high school and decided to go to college. And the only college I could afford was the one I wanted to go to anyway. Had a little opportunity to do some uh, football related recruiting on me. I went to Texas A&M. Uh, Texas A&M is a uh, was a school that was an ROTC school, and there were two things about it. One is the the whole student body was ROTC. You couldn't go to Texas A&M and not get into the ROTC. Suited me fine. The second thing about it was that they paid me 25 cents a day because I was in the enlisted reserve at that point and wore a uniform and for the next seven years I wore a uniform. So uh, that's how I got in service. Uh, when I graduated from a and uh, they hadn't let us go to summer camp. They made us uh, go all summer in uh, academics and that way we didn't get to go to summer camp. Now, you can't be an ROTC officer unless you're going to summer camp. And I was graduating and I hadn't been to summer camp, but the Army had a neat way to arrange for that. They sent me to OCS. <laughs> and so I'm an OCS graduate as well as an ROTC Reserve Officer graduate. And once I got out of OCS, they had a place for me. And th that was in the 1303rd. Went to the 1303rd as cadre of the outfit. They fairly carefully designed the 1303rd, and I had uh, some qualifications that made me uh, fit. And went to the 1303rd, and just for books, this book is all about the Company B, 1303rd. That's my company. And Joe Fitzharris is the man who took the diary of the 13th of Company B and wrote it up in what I consider just a tremendous job of telling our story. And, and the other thing that Earl was able to do with that, and, and uh, it's a great story, the wonderful pictures that they did of the bridges that they built as they moved across is, is a marvelous story. Yeah, John told me a lot of things I didn't know, a tremendous number of things. But uh, one of the things I can tell you, sort of casually, is and hey, I was one of those guys that was building bridges that he talked about. The ones across the Moselle, the, uh, the one at Tool. Uh, and I was the guy who was trying to get those bridges across. Or one of the people, not the guy by the way. Okay, now don't get ahead of ourselves, Earl. Okay, can you pass, pass the mic down to, uh, to uh, Don? Don, uh, when, uh, when your brother, Vern, got into the uh, theater uh, and, and after the breakout can, uh, can you describe some of the stories that he had uh, the, the missions he did what he did uh, as a part of supporting the mission of the third army well one thing <clears throat> during that period of time there were many changes in the arm, army structure that is and how uh, uh, the, going back to the 30s the square divisions and graduating with the triangle division and uh, how they treated on top of that he was a member of the cavalry and they didn't have many horses anymore <laughs> so uh, that was uh, uh, and Patton of course he was innovative 
And uh, when Vern went overseas, uh, he was overseas as an Armored Corps uh, soldier. And uh, but transferred, he was transferred into what was then became known as the cavalry, or was the cavalry, but uh, it was the, uh, he went into the 42nd Cavalry Reconnaissance Squad. Now the structure of a, uh, those of you who are Army, uh, the uh, 40, uh, Cavalry Reconnaissance Squad is something like six to 800 men, uh, roughly battalion size. Uh, really, uh, but, uh, that was a, uh, a troop. A troop was roughly company <coughs> size. And uh, above, on the uh, top side of that, uh, they reported to what was called a corps, and uh, or a uh, there was another uh, term for it. And then above that was uh, uh, 12th Army Corps. So uh, it was structured completely different. The whole object of, and if I may read the, uh, their, what, how they were charged. Let's see. Uh, in World War II, it was concentrated at the squadron level, and all non-divisional mechanized cavalry regiments were broken up in the late 1943 and early 44 to form separate groups and squadrons. These were designed to perform reconnaissance missions employed in filtration tactics, fire <coughs> and, and maneuver, and engage in combat only to the extent necessary to accomplish their missions. <coughs> that meant that uh, if they went charging into a, to a town and it was heavily defended, it was, was the opposition was greater than what they could immediately handle without stopping, they went around it. And uh, uh, each cavalry group is comprised of a headquarters and headquarters uh, 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 a group and also two or more squadrons. And uh, the squadrons, like I say, uh, below that was a troop and that was roughly a company size, but these sizes didn't mean much. Uh, <coughs> they were very, uh, very liberal with how they handled those uh, people. Um, it was generally assumed, uh, assigned to an army, that is a squadron now, a constant squadron assigned to an army which is attached to a particular permanent basis to a specific core uh, and, uh, and was frequently further attached down to division level for operation. In addition to these were separate mechanized cavalry reconnaissance uh, squadrons in groups. Each light and armored division contained one organized identically, and that doesn't really grammatically make a lot of sense, each heavy armored Division included a smaller armored reconnaissance battalion, and uh, uh, they pretty much had a free go of it. Uh, once they, uh, this was now after the breakthrough, and basically the army was heading back east after going west across the uh, peninsula. There, uh, he started uh, uh, trying to. Uh, uh, well, they just, they just ran helter-skelter behind the enemy lines. And my brother said that once they broke through, uh, they never saw what would normally be called a front line. And during those days with that army, there really was no such thing as a front line. But uh, uh, it was uh, hit, go to the hit opposition, and then we'll take it out. The... Uh uh, did he say what unit he was in direct support of? That, that varied. Uh, at times, 4th Armor, at times, uh, other units. And incidentally, the, uh, a, a squadron is, consists of tanks, armored cars, half tracks, six bys, and uh, there were trucks. And jeeps. And jeeps. Uh, my brother had a jeep. And uh, uh, the six bodies were used mostly for transporting what you might call armored uh, or uh, uh, infantry support. In other words, they were cavalry, but they rode trucks. Like in the old days, 100 years ago, 
we had the uh, uh, mounted infantry. And uh, they had the cavalry and mounted infantry. They all rode horses, but the ones on mount mounted infantry did not uh, charge down looking for somebody, or, you know, like they might have done during the Civil War. And uh, so that was... Uh, and and uh, one of the things I'd like to bring to your attention, uh, again, the, the whole story of the cavalry units has not been well written. Uh, one of the speakers that we had several years ago, Harry Yidey, some of you remember Harry, and, and Harry actually guided our tour when we did the uh, First Army area uh, several years ago. He's got a new book out called Steeds of Steel. That is exclusively exclusively about the uh, the calves. So it's a uh, I bring that to your uh, attention. Uh, Merle, can you push the mic down? Yeah, uh, Merle, uh, you were in the Sixth Armored Division in a AAA unit. Uh, when did you first get into the Lorraine campaign? And uh, can you describe some of your memories on that? We were. Going down the Normandy Peninsula, we were to the right of the 4th Armor. Uh, we were right next to the coast. When we got to Ranchies, Ranchies, if you're French, I guess, we took a hard right turn and went toward Brest in order to capture a port. That's a 200-mile jump going the wrong way. From there, we were sent straight across France ended up in the Nancy and Metz area, were part of that attack. Um, I think it might be helpful because we have new people and we have more and more wives coming. I'd like to digress and describe an armored division so that you can understand it. An armored division has three tank battalions, a total of about 263 tanks. It has three armored infantry battalions, and it has three heavy, <coughs> excuse me, heavy artillery battalions. Those combinations form themselves in the combat A, combat B, and combat R. A and B usually attack parallel. If one breaks through, combat R can be used to reinforce if one gets in trouble, the combat R can be assigned to help the other. Now, that's the core of an armored division, is those nine battalions, or companies. I guess can't. tanks are called companies, artillery is battalions. Now, surrounding those are single battalions, medics, signal, uh, engineers, bridge builders, if you please, uh, tank destroyers, recon units, uh, anti-aircraft units. And I was in the 777 Anti-Aircraft Artillery Battalion. Our mission was to protect all personnel in the division from attack from low-level German fighters. Uh, I don't know how successful we were, but we shot down 111. We were part of this, we were permanently attached to the 6th Armored Division from Normandy to the end of the war. And I remember the Northern France campaign as mud, mud, and more mud. I saw six by six trucks with chains on all six axles, buried to the axle. I saw tanks with duck feet extension bolted on each tread, which I think were invented in the field. And the tanks were mired down over the bus of bogies. But one advantage, the Germans weren't that well off because their equipment wasn't as good as ours, their ground equipment. Um, it rained, and it rained, and there was more rain. It was cold, and we were miserable because up till then, what we enjoyed, I hate to use the word enjoyed, 
But under Patton, we moved, we accomplished things. We got things done. That was not our nature to sit under a tent or a tarp. I don't know how much more you want, Don. Well, let, let, let me interject something with that. And John, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember, but I think in your book, you have a chart about the days of bad weather days where they were not aerial support. And it is revealing. I, I think only like a third, uh, as I recall, a third of the days these guys were able to get uh, air support. So, uh, I mean, it certainly didn't help the Germans either. But it, 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 as we have talked about so many times, it was the air battle that really helped push things forward. And, uh, and the mud was there. Uh, uh, if we could go back down to Earl. <coughs> Uh, as the Germans retreated, and, and I think it's probably fair to say uh, <laughs> in 1940, the French blew a few bridges out uh, to keep the Germans from coming through. Uh, they got rebuilt, and then as they were retreating, they started blowing bridges. Is, is that uh, fair to say? Well, there were a lot of blown bridges in Europe. <laughs> and some of them had been blown for a long time. Uh, and that was... Uh, uh, it's fundamental. If you were retreating, you blew the bridges. You know, you don't let them get there any faster than they can. And even relatively small bridges can make it awfully difficult for the tankers to get through. And uh, you got to, uh, you got to stay right on top of your whole unit, the, the uh, infantry divisions and the armored divisions had to be in support of each other, so we had to keep those bridges there. That was just one of the things we did, but we built a lot of bridges. Did that tell you what you wanted? Uh, well, you, you built, uh, explain the kind of bridges that uh, uh, your regiment had. Uh, you had both rigid bridges and floating bridges, right? We didn't have bridges. You we had lumber. Bridges. <laughs> now, there's a difference there. Explain it. There's, there's a, a uh, engineer, uh, Bailey Bridge Company, and they haul the bridges around. If we need to build a Bailey Bridge, we get the Bailey structure. Now, the Bailey is just a big erector set. You know what it is, do you know? It's a real big erector set. A panel weighs 600 pounds, and that's just one panel of a, of a bridge that is just full of panels. And so when we wanted to build a Bailey Bridge, while well, we found where there was a, a Bailey Bridge company somewhere around, and uh, uh, somebody had, somehow they'd get us together and we'd build a bridge. And if we needed to build a pontoon bridge, well, there were pontoon companies that happened to have pontoons. Incidentally, pontoons are nasty things to handle in a fast-running river. <laughs> but uh, particularly if you got no, no experience with that sort of thing. Uh, we had a young man from Tennessee who was a river rat, who saved my life on the river by taking a, a, a little old boat and coming out and getting me off a little bit of an island. And uh, so pontoons are nasty things to work with. But the pontoons, the big pontoons, you had treads on them, and you could get the tanks across. Tankers did not like to go across those pontoon bridges, if I would understand rightly. <laughs> That's what they would tell me, at least. And. Uh, then we built the Baileys, but most of the bridges we built, we had to get the tanks, the whole tank operations across, and the other heavy equipment. You have some pretty heavy artillery you've got to get across. Some of it's track mounted. And so we had to get a bridge up there that would take 45 tons of load in each direction, or 70 tons maximum. That's a fairly heavy thing. You don't see those on American highways. And uh, so we had to build those kind of bridges, and we didn't have any equipment. We had to find it. Uh, when we were in France, why some of the French uh, um, foundries and people who rolled steel and that sort of thing uh, got a little bit discouraged with us because we just took their ruddy uh, I-beams that we needed when we needed them. And the same thing happened 
Uh, matter of fact, I stole more stuff in World War II than anything else I did. But quickly, I'll tell you, well, let me tell you quickly about my motor sergeant. He got trained to be a motor sergeant by running a thief ring in Detroit where they'd steal cars and rebuild them and sell them over in Windsor. You couldn't get a better motor sergeant for uh, an engineer out there. And because when we needed trucks that we didn't have or when a, a, one of our little tractors, our R4s or D4s got banged up and this sort of thing, we didn't have time to requisition. You know, you read that there was there were, uh, uh, equipment uh, depots that followed us just like we went right along with the, the army moving and uh, they would have the, this equipment that we needed and we'd blow a track on a D4 and you know that's a little little tractor, a little cat tractor, not a little tiny tractor and we'd blow a track up and all you could do is drag it out of the way if you could get enough trucks tied to it but you couldn't do anything, you're not going to rebuild that thing and so if we did it right, well, we would fill out a requisition and give it to somebody who would pass it along and somebody to prove it and it would come back and it come back to a depot and the depot would try to find us to give us our tractor. Now, when you got a guy, a man like Bailey, who's my motor sergeant, you don't wait for that sort of thing. <laughs> Literally now, you go steal, you go find out where the depot is and some night you go in there and steal what you need. <laughs> Now, I'm, now this is no joke about this. This is what we did. I know they got a general court martial when I tried to take the same procedures after the Pacific. But they, they somehow they, they hadn't learned how to really do things. <laughs> but uh, but at any rate, we built, we, we went and got the equipment that we needed when we were building bridges. We did a lot of other things, you know. We built, uh, we did a lot of minefield removal, a whole bunch of things. Engineers don't just build bridges. But, uh, we would uh, go scrounge up some equipment. Now, you know, our biggest bridge that we built in World War II was the bridge, uh, the high-level bridge across the Rhine at Metz. And that's a bridge. We were really proud of it. But uh, we built, and, and you were talking about the Moselle, you know, the bridge on, and the bridges that were washing out, and this sort of thing. Our bridge at Toul washed out. We had a fine bridge there. And they had the highest level of rain on the river that we, they had ever had, they told us. And uh, we watched our bridge go. But uh, we built the bridges, and we built the bridges to get you guys across. And uh, we, had, we built bridges. Now, you know, it's nice to build bridges, but when they're shooting at you with 88s, everybody know what an 88 is? 88 was the very best artillery piece in World War II. And you could shoot the doggone thing, you could shoot, you decide, you know, you want to knock a wing off a gnat with the 88, you decide which ring, wing do you want to hit him. But they are, and when you're trying to build a bridge, and somebody up on the hill has got an 88, then you call it for air support. And you know what we got? 47s, P-47s came in and, and uh, slow things down for us. But uh, well, we, we, we would build a bridge across a river, and on the other side, the Germans would just pass the edge of the river, and they had mortars, and they'd be mortars. You know, everybody know what a mortar is? <laughs> well, they had, we would get mortar fire over the river, while with our infantry between us and the Germans, they were still firing mortar fire over the river uh, to stop us from building the bridges. So we had some, some interesting times there. That's, that you That's great. Know? That's great. Yeah, go ahead. I, had an outst I have an outstanding memory of a bridge across the Rhine River at Oppenheim. This was, I learned after the war, I didn't know at the time, a 900-foot pontoon bridge built in nine hours. That's our bridge. <laughs> that's, that's the one I personally crossed the day after Patton crossed it. And I learned that in the history of the 6th Armored Division book. Now, uh, the way we did it is we put a tank across, 
pontoons are crossways, incidentally, and then the tread is across the pontoons. And as a tank goes across, it's perhaps uh, five, six feet above the water, and then it ends up about a foot from the water. <laughs> the bridge is flexible. So you put a tank across, and then a jeep, and then maybe a six by six, and then another tank. But you don't put three, four tanks together. <laughs> um, that bridge sticks in my memory for not only having been there and crossed it and gotten the other side and reassembled, but then the Germans came over that night and lit it up like day with flares. And not one shot was fired and not one bomb was dropped until we were about 50 miles on down the road. <laughs> Uh, let, 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 uh, let, let's come back to that. Let's, let's come back. Um, Don, uh, did, did Vern mention any uh, funny or happy moments as part of his uh, time before? Uh, and and let's, let's talk about that before we talk about his capture. Uh, the funniest was, of course, after he was captured, but before he was captured, no. Uh, uh, it was a good time. Uh, they 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 were they saw the country. They raced around uh, like a bunch of scatterbrained people, and, uh, uh, just looking for the, an enemy. And nobody, uh, there was no such thing as a front line. So they couldn't really. Uh, uh, joy was short, but they all had a good time. But but the. Uh I think it's fair to say that his cab unit was really trying to find out where they were getting fired on, uh, withdrawing and then calling in uh, the, the fourth, the sixth, uh, whatever uh, armored or infantry divisions to uh, to really take the attack. So so they were kind of like a kind of like Earl down there. When you're on the river, you're kind of like in a shooting gallery. Is that fair to say? <laughs> uh, they didn't take too much punishment as far as uh, fire goes. There were a few incidences that uh, uh, might be notable, but for the most part, they just stop, look at it, and take this road. It was uh, just a lot easier. There were people coming up behind you, uh, organized uh, uh, divisions and battalions and such, and they, uh, they take care of the bigger targets. How, how did he get uh, captured? Uh, they were, um, they never spent the same, uh, I don't think probably only once or twice that they spent a, two nights in a row in one place. They were constantly moving and this one night uh, uh, they stopped in this uh, patch of woods and uh, this is now the 42nd, but he doesn't know it was all of the 42nd because, uh, in fact, it was only Troop A that he met was a member of. Troop B was about eight miles north. And uh, he was uh, the CO of the uh, squadron commander, said, uh, ask him to uh, deliver some stuff up, items for uh, up to uh, uh, Troop B. And uh, he was supposed to meet the troop in that uh, a town there. And uh, so, he had a driver, incidentally, he had a driver who was one of the infantry, I don't want to call them infantrymen, they were cavalrymen, uh, foot cav cavalrymen, and uh, who loved jeeps and such, and he had volunteered quite a while before that. He wanted to drive a jeep and ask the CEO if he could drive uh, Vern's jeep, and that was okay with Vern. And uh, so he had, a, uh, the two of them then went, and uh, uh, there was a Frenchman there also, uh, free, free French, right? Free French. French right. Uh, right. They were, uh, free French, incidentally, were uh, partisans. They were guerrillas, uh, as opposed to, uh, uh, this was uh, FFI. FFI. Uh, the uh, uh, free French were actually under, uh, was actually an army under Charles de Gaulle. And they were uniformed soldiers, uh, American uniformed but uh, a regular army unit. Uh, the FFI, which was uh, uh, fighting French of the interior. Free French of the interior. 
Prefects of the Interior. Right, please, sir. Yeah. Okay. Prefects of the Interior. And uh, uh, he insisted on going along because he knew where the town was. And uh, his wife didn't want him to go. But he was, a, uh, oh, he was eager. Well, the CO said it was okay, so Vern said it was okay, and the driver said it was okay. And the, the back seat of the Jeep, uh, the old uh, World War II Jeep, was all filled with uh, Vern's uh, equipment, radio equipment, and so forth. And he would uh, go run back and forth between the two outfits, A Troop and B Troop, uh, taking care of both radios also. Because uh, something happened to the uh, uh, B Troop uh, radio man, uh, uh, repairman, and uh, whether he went AWOL, got wounded, who knows. But uh, so Vern had to do that a few times. In this particular case, uh, along with the Frenchman who knew where the uh, uh, town was, they took off all three sitting in the front seat, and it's awkward in the Jeep. But um, uh, they got to the town, and it was all quiet, and there was nothing uh, 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 to raise suspicion, but uh, uh, they had been told to meet in town. Well, they walked, looked at town for quite a while, and they didn't see our outfit, but they didn't see anything else any uh, either. And uh, so finally they uh, decided to go on into town, and uh, when they got into town, like the Germans popped out of all the buildings and started, when they realized they were Americans, you, you know, you see a jeep come in and you uh, see uh, <coughs> uniforms and you don't pay attention to markings or anything like that. Uh, it's, uh, hey, it's a uniform, it must be one of ours, it's one of our guys. But uh, uh, they found out pretty quick that these guys were Americans and they started shooting at them. And, we found out, or Vern and uh, his driver found out they were Germans, and uh, they uh, sped through town. It's just a small town. There was a, uh, a side road, so they turned up the side road. It was a dead end, and uh, so they turned around, came out, and decided to leave town the same same direction. Uh, uh, Vern was sitting way down, way down in the jeep, firing his gun like this here. The driver was uh, the driver was uh, crunched way down, driving like this here, looking out the side. But they started shooting out the tires, and they just got a little ways out of town, and uh, 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 they spun out because the car, uh, the jeep started weaving. If you've ever taken a lady whip the wheels, uh, the car, the uh, jeep vehicle will start uh, uh, side side swiping. It was it ended up going in the ditch, facing uh, back towards the town. And uh, Joe, his uh, driver, uh, hopped out and uh, uh, hid behind the wheel. They were in the ditch. And uh, the Frenchman took off with the driver's uh, carbine. And uh, Byrne was on the floorboards of the Jeep. And uh, of course, the thing was being peppered with, um, with uh, shots. And uh, he heard, uh, he heard that Joe, the driver, was hit, and uh, there was uh, just a sound. You can tell it was sounds. And uh, then he was hit a couple more times, and then there were no sounds, just the sound of a bullet striking a body. And Vern knew he was dead, and the Frenchman was long gone. And during the wild weaving down the road, uh, Vern's bag of ammo for the, uh, he had a burp gun, 45. The only thing they're good for really is spraying. Uh, and uh, he had shot up the two uh, uh, clips that he had, which are gang together, and they could turn around for, I believe, a total of 30 rounds. And uh, they were coming closer, shooting. And uh, when they got fairly close, you couldn't see them. And uh, in fact, there was one guy you could see. and. Uh, he was throwing a concussion, concussion grenade, and uh, uh, that he burned, felt it. The guy got closer, and he figured the next one uh, he was going to throw another one, and he burned, figured hey, that one he wouldn't survive. So the only thing he had, no ammunition, was a uh, raincoat. So he waved the raincoat and, uh, and surrendered. Uh, do you know if the body of the driver was ever retrieved? I, I'm sure it was, 
my mother wrote a letter to uh, his CO, and uh, uh, they obviously knew uh, when uh, uh, Troop B finally reached the town late, uh, they sound found the jeep and um, uh, all shot up and they all, I'm sure they found the body. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, as we visited the uh, cemetery on our trip, it's always interesting to find out how many people are still missing. Listen, I, I want you to recognize Don as you're telling his brother's story. Didn't he do a great job? Merrill, uh, can you tell us some of the funny and sad stories that uh, maybe you have? Sometimes the little things are the funny things. Uh, I was in Nancy, France. I was on the second level of an old chateau. And that same day, General Patton drove up and entered the main entrance to talk to General Grove. Uh, that night, uh, we were looking for a section of the chateau that didn't have the roof blown off. And I found a place up in the attic with some exposed rafters. I found a section of the door, and I suspended it with two hay baling wires <laughs> and rolled my bedroll out on it. Well, that, I was a sergeant, but one of my best friends was a private, but I had it too nice for him, I guess. So Howard found an old saw, and he started from the bottom with the saw, and the door started swinging on the wires, and he got half through with the saw, and the wires broke, and my butt went through the door panels of my bedroom. <laughs> Somehow that was funny to both of us. <laughs> luckily for Howard, who's my best friend today, uh, it was funny to me. <laughs> I might say I was the battalion operations sergeant. I was a five-striper. A lot of my time was spent with the battery headquarters. And the battery headquarters, of course, was always fairly close to the division headquarters. So uh, there were times when we set up a CP, got all the maps out, situation maps, kept them up, uh, issued, typed and issued and sent reports about everything, ammunition used and casualties and airplanes down and all that stuff. Um, however, way back in August, when Patton first committed us to battle, the first day, this is worth mentioning. I want you to get the flavor that I was on the front lines. And we were attacked by a German fighter coming right in on our half track. I was in a command half track with a single 50 caliber. And the gunner and assistant stayed with the vehicle. I found a ditch right next door. Uh, I think there's two dents in the ditch where my knees banged right in the bottom of the ditch. The plane got so low it had to pull up and then he released his rockets and they blew up some apple trees behind us and right after that the plane crashed. My gunner got him with 68 rounds. And that was the first plane that our battalion accounted for. Um, there, there are humorous moments mostly because GIs under stress come up with unusual ways to entertain themselves. <laughs> we had an Italian from St. Paul, Andy Ashettino. He's dead now. And he had dark curly hair and he had a way of grabbing his hair and pulling his scalp back, pretending he had a wig. <laughs> and that always got a laugh because I never could do it. <laughs> Don, what else did you ask? Uh, a sad moment that you had. Uh... I think the saddest moments, without a doubt, are when you lose a buddy. Or perhaps the time I looked down in a tank where an 88 had gone through both sides, the tank had been burned out, and the driver's seat was the frame of his pistol, 
in a pile of white ashes. And uh, you don't have to say more, but it was very common. Uh, I had been told, I didn't count them, our division, 6th Armored Division, entered Normandy with 500, no, no, excuse me, 263 tanks. By the end of the war, only six originals were running. Earl, um, what were some of the uh, more memorable, happy, sad things that you remember from? Well, I'll, I'll, there, were, there were a number of funny things happened, you know. Uh, the uh, life doesn't just stay sad all the time. But uh, the one thing that I remember, which an event, a process that was funny, we uh, we were kept moving. We were 12 corps, one of their uh, universal units. Anything they needed that did somebody else couldn't do, we. Uh, got sent to do, including scouting the flank. We were, 12th Corps was on the third flank and we scouted. But uh, the one thing that happened was that we were in a place in France and we had bivouac. A bivouac, put up your pup tents and put up your uh, uh, nest tent and uh, uh, settle in while you go do something. And we were, had done that, and we hadn't got our orders for where to go from there, and uh, figured we'd get to spend the night. And about noon, we'd finished whatever it was we were doing. And so I decided to give, uh, to give passes to the guys. This is a little unusual, but hey, there's a little town here next to us. And uh, let them go in there, and uh, not everybody, you can't do that all at once. But uh, let some of the guys go in town and uh, come back at on schedules and uh, just be back in time for us to leave tomorrow morning. And so um, everything went fine until about, uh, oh, must have been 6 o'clock in the evening and this sort of thing. And we got ordered to get out and go. We had a place to go to and go right now. And uh, I had just had three guys that some of our best soldiers, Cunningham was one of them, he was a great kid. And uh, they were in town somewhere. And I'm not going to go off and leave my men. You don't do that. And so uh, I figured, well, I got one of the sergeants with me and we're going into town so we can find them. And so the, the thing to do was, but you know, we can't search the whole town, so we uh, went, and the guy, the sergeant with me was one who spoke French, that was necessary. And so we went to the gendarmes and we said, uh, we're looking for these guys and we want to know if you'll help us look. He said, oh, we know how to do that. And so they started us on a, on a trip. And we were going from house to house. And you know what kind of houses they were going <laughs> Yeah, house to house. And the gendarmes were having a wonderful time. We, would, we would started out with about half a dozen, you know, and we were down to two of them. <laughs> and, and they would, they didn't just go to the house, you know, ask for them. Uh, they, they knew what kind of answers they'd get. They went up the, the stairs and door to door, opened the door to see if any of our guys were in. And so they invited us to do the same thing. Got rather interesting. But uh, at one point, uh, just before I had opened the door to look in, all of a sudden there was a window broke, and down below there was one of these little uh, green houses, you know, with a glass roof on it, and something fell through there, and there was all sorts of commotion. And we didn't know what it was. And uh, so ended up, we went back to camp without the boys. And we got there, and they were already there. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out that they didn't know what we were coming after, but they figured that wasn't a good place to get caught. <laughs> and so they had bailed out the window, fallen through the glass of the greenhouse, somehow got back to their Jeep and headed back to camp before we got there. And I thought that was sort of funny. 